Once again, welcome to Physics 142 Online. We're moving today from our discussion of harmonic motion or oscillatory motion to a description of wave motion, and they're very closely related to each other, which should become clear by the end of this video. First, let's talk generally about the kinds of wave motion we can have. And there's a distinction we should make between pulses and waves. First of all, a wave is a propagating disturbance in some kind of medium. A wave pulse is when that disturbance happens once and doesn't repeat itself. So in the sketch here, you can see that we've plucked a string that extends from point A to point B, and there's a pulse, a disturbance in that string that's propagating from the left to the right, from time T1 to T2 to T3. That's a wave pulse. Now, if we have a series of pulses or a repeating pulse, that's referred to as a pulse train or a wave train. And now we can distinguish between two different kinds of waves. One is a periodic wave, one that has these pulses appear at equally spaced time intervals. So for example, from point A to point B, we have a series of pulses. Uh, they're separated in distance. Identical points on the pulses are separated by one wavelength. And in this case, the rope or the string that forms the medium shakes up and down. Any individual point moves up and down. But the overall pattern shows these periodic waves. But they don't have any specific shape. There is, however, a special kind of periodic wave that's called a harmonic wave. And that's just a fancy way of saying this is a wave that has a sinusoidal or cosinusoidal wave function. So here we see a plot of y, the vertical displacement of the string, as a function of x, the position along the string. And the black line, the x-axis, simply shows the equilibrium position of the string if there were no disturbance. Again, the wavelength is the distance between identical points on the wave. Now, from the standpoint of the direction of motion of the medium, we can also make a distinction between two different types of waves. If the medium, and this is the case with a wave on a string, if the medium is composed of particles that move up and down, while the wave itself and its energy move perpendicular to that, we have what's called a transverse wave. Transverse simply means perpendicular. On the other hand, if we have a wave, and an example of this could be a sound wave, where the oscillations of the particles in the medium are horizontal, which is in the same direction, or along the same direction, as the motion of the wave itself, then we have a longitudinal wave. What we'd like to do here at the beginning of this section on waves is not just show some pretty pictures, but work out a mathematical way to describe the motion and the shape of the wave at any particular point in time. So here we once again show a snapshot of what the string looks like when it's undergoing a harmonic wave motion at a particular time. So again, this is showing us the displacement of any point on the medium, any point in the string. So the y represents a displacement, and x is simply a point along the string. We can also show a complementary graph that shows the displacement versus time for any particular fixed point in the medium. So if we look at one point along the string, we'll see that its displacement is first positive and then zero and negative and repeats itself just like a simple harmonic oscillator does. And this is how wave motion is like simple harmonic motion. Each individual piece of the medium undergoes simple harmonic motion up and down and the collection of all of these simple harmonic oscillators that are coupled together forms a wave. What about wave speed? Can we work out a simple relationship for how the speed of a wave relates to its other characteristics? And of course the answer is yes. The speed of the wave is the same as the speed of the propagation of its energy or the speed of the propagation of the disturbance. 
So here if we look at a pulse train, we can see that the peak at time t is at point A. That same peak at time t plus one period of the wave motion has moved over to point B and so on to point C. So the speed is actually the distance divided by the time interval and the distance traveled from point A to point B is simply the wavelength, right? The distance between identical points on the wave. So in a time capital T, which is one period of the back and forth motion, the wave has traveled a distance equal to one lambda, or wavelength. And you might remember from our section on harmonic motion that the period is the reciprocal of the frequency f. So what we find with this is one of the single most important equations that we need to know to discuss the properties of waves. If I know the frequency of the wave, how many cycles per second it undergoes, and if I know the wavelength, the product of those two is always the wave speed. Now, this only tells me the relationship between these three quantities. It doesn't tell me, for example, why the speed of sound in air has the particular value it does, or why the speed of a vibrational pulse on a piano string or a guitar string has the particular value it does. Those things are determined by the properties of the medium. And so, for example, a one-dimensional string, like a guitar string or a piano string, has a velocity that's given by the square root of the tension of the string divided by the mass per unit length of the string. We can show where this comes from when we use Newton's second law to analyze the motion of each individual piece of the string. And so what this tells me is that the properties of the medium, the tension or the force, and the mass per unit length, those determine ultimately how fast the wave can propagate. And this equation makes sense because the tension uh, is, is, is something like the stiffness of the, the string. The, the greater the tension, the greater the ability of the wave to travel from one point to another. So if the tension increases, so does the velocity. Likewise, the mass per unit length, that's a measure of the inertia. And so a string with a lower mass per unit length has less inertia, therefore allows the wave to propagate faster. So V goes up. Mathematically, what we would really love to do is have an equation that would tell us for any point on the string at any time what its displacement is. And so once again, let's look at these two complementary graphs. For one specific point on the string, this shows the displacement versus time. The distance, or the in this case, the time uh, separating equal displacements is one period of the wave motion. When we plot y versus x, this shows the displacement of any point on the string at a particular fixed time. And so these two waves are given by, on the left-hand side, a sine function of time. And omega is the angular frequency that we're already familiar with from simple harmonic motion. Phi 1 is a phase constant. When we look at the displacement of a point on the string as a function of time, what we're looking at is y as a function of x, right? And this constant k that appears inside the argument of the sine function, we'll learn in just a minute what that really represents. But the same kind of function describes what we see. And what we would like to do is actually combine the position depend the time dependence and the position dependence of the displacement into one master equation. And this is sometimes called the harmonic wave equation. So it tells me if, if I know a position on the string given by x and a time t, then plugging in the values that are in the argument and taking the sine of that will give me the displacement of the string. So we'll see how to extract information from this in just a few minutes. Now let's consider uh, the, the speed of a traveling wave and how we can determine the speed of the traveling wave from the harmonic wave equation right here. So, the speed of the traveling wave, uh, if we look at a time t, the wave is at a position given by the blue curve, and then at a later time, t plus delta t, it's moved off to the right, a small distance delta x. 
And let's assume that the wave is traveling at a constant speed v. So v is the rate of propagation of the wave and therefore its energy. So the speed then, if the wave itself in a time delta t moves a distance delta x, the ratio of those two is the wave speed. Now let's look at our harmonic wave function. At, at point A, the vertical displacement of that point on the string is y1, a sine kx minus omega t plus phi. All right, and then a short time later, that point y2 is, at, at point b here, is given by plugging in x plus delta x and t plus delta t into the wave function, right there. So, the point is that even though the wave itself has moved a distance delta x, the displacement at a and b is the same. And so we can set those two quantities equal to one another. And when we do that, uh, if we have two sine functions that are equal to one another, then their arguments have to be equal. So setting those arguments equal to one another gives this expression right here, k, x plus delta x, minus omega, t plus delta t, plus phi, equals kx minus omega t plus phi. And when we cancel out the terms that are the same on both sides of the equation, we get k delta x minus omega delta t equals zero. And if we just take delta x over delta t and solve for that, we get, of course, the speed of the wave. And here we see how the speed of the wave is related to the angular frequency omega and this quantity k, which is actually called the wave number. So if I have the harmonic wave equation right here, and I simply take the ratio of omega over k, the coefficient of the time variable and the coefficient of the position variable, that gives me a quick way of determining the wave speed v. That's another equation in addition to v equals f lambda that we should remember. And the two are actually the same equation, just cast in different forms. One thing about the harmonic wave function here, there could be a plus or a minus sign in between the kx and the omega t term, and the sign of that simply reflects whether the wave is propagating to the right or to the left. So if that sign is negative, that means the wave is propagating to the right or in the positive x direction. If it's positive, it means it's propagating to the left. Now let's also look at the wavelength of a traveling wave and how we can determine the wavelength from the harmonic wave function. So first, let's set phi equal to 0 at, and look at the wave shape at a particular time, t, a snapshot in time. So if we set phi equal to 0, uh, that just means that it's starting off with 0 displacement at x equals 0. It doesn't really change the shape. It just shifts the, uh, the wave itself. And when y is equal to a maximum, such as we have here at point x1, the sine of kx has to equal 1. And that's pretty easy. We know what the solutions to that equation are. We know that kx would have to be pi over 2, or it could be 2 pi plus phi over, pi over 2, 4 pi plus pi over 2, and so on and so forth. But for the two peak locations in the sketch, x1 and x2, one of those would be pi over 2, the other would be 2 pi plus pi over 2. So let's say that kx1 is pi over 2, kx2, 2 pi plus pi over 2, and if we subtract those two equations from one another, we see that k times x2 minus x1 is just 2 pi. That's the difference of the right-hand sides of those two equations. What's x2 minus x1? We'll look at the picture. x2 minus x1 is the distance between adjacent peaks in the wave, and that distance in space is called the wavelength. So k lambda is 2 pi, and if we solve for lambda, we see that lambda is very simply related to this constant k that I introduced a few minutes ago without really telling you what it was. Well, k really represents the wave number. And the physical connection is if you take 2 pi divided by k, you get the wavelength. That's another equation that we should remember. Once again, there's a relationship between the period of a wave 
and one of the terms that's in that harmonic wave function. And here, it's the term omega. Uh, the f function that we're going, the relationship that we're going to get will be a familiar one, but we're going to do the same kind of analysis here. If we take the function y as a function of t that happens at x equals zero, then we can see that when y is equal to a maximum, the sine of omega t has to be one. And then there's going to be two simple solutions to that equation. Omega t can be pi over two, or it can be two pi over pi over two, and that would be the very next position, or the very next time, at which the displacement would be a maximum. So, if we write down omega t, 1 is pi over 2, and omega t2 is 2 pi plus pi over 2, and then subtract those, we get a very similar relationship. Here we have omega times t2 minus t1 is 2 pi. t2 minus t1, that's the time between identical places on the wave, and we call that the period, the time it takes for the wave to cycle from one peak to the next peak. So omega t is 2 pi, and we can solve for the period t and see that it's equal to 2 pi over omega. So this relationship is identical to the one that we determined when we were talking about a single harmonic oscillator. Once again, it's showing us that a wave is made up of many individual harmonic oscillators, all moving in concert. Here's the summary, and we'll close with this today as an introduction to the mathematics of wave motion. This quantity here is the harmonic wave function y as a function of x and t tells us the displacement of the medium at a position x and a time t. And this really applies most naturally to the one-dimensional string that's stretched out like a guitar string. A is the amplitude, which is related to the energy of the wave. K, that's the wave number, and we know that it's related to the wavelength. Omega is the angular frequency which of course gives the period. And finally, phi is the phase constant that reflects the initial conditions of the wave, where it was in its motion when we started the clock to keep track of its motion. And finally, just the reminder that the sign in between the position and the time terms tells us the direction of propagation of the wave. So in class, we'll look at this again and show some examples of how one would use this wave function to extract quantities like the wavelength, the period, the direction of propagation, and so on. So, I'll see you in class.